Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at the reabsorption in the kidney nephron, the reabsorption of sodium, the reabsorption of glucose and amino acids, the absorption of water, the adaptations for reabsorption, and then we'll finish with a summary. So remember, at the kidney, the main purpose is to filter the blood and remove things that we don't want. In ultrafiltration, the filtrate is produced from the glomerulus of capillaries. So remember, we've got a bunch of capillaries which are grouped together as the glomerulus. And as this approaches the end of the nephron tube, which is the Bowman's capsule, certain substances of a particular size are sent out from the blood into the filtrate. And the collection of all of these molecules and the fluid is what we call the filtrate. However, because the kidney receives so much blood, if we just allowed this all to go straight to the urine and be lost, we would quickly run out of water and salts and it would be very dangerous. So some of the components of the filtrate need to be excreted, but some of them need to be kept and reabsorbed. The main solute that goes out and is fully excreted and not reabsorbed is urea, because this is toxic to us. But glucose, amino acids, water and some mineral ions are very important to us to keep, and therefore we reabsorb them. So this table just kind of highlights how things are reabsorbed and what particular substances end up going through all the way to excretion and which ones don't. So we've got the concentration in the blood plasma here before being filtered. We've got the concentration in the filtrate, so in the nephron. And then we've got the concentration in the final urine product. So if we look through the bloods, comparing it to the filtrate, not many proteins go through due to their size. The amino acids, glucose, urea and mineral ions all get filtered through because they are of smaller size. However, in the urine, there's no amino acids, no glucose, and there are a lot less mineral ions that got filtered. And this is because we want to keep them. But the urea concentration goes up because as we make the urine and it gets stored, everything else is removed, but the urea remains. And so its proportional amount in the fluid goes up. So a lot of things are taken back which we need, and those things that we don't want are left to go to the urine. And most of the reabsorption happens at the region of the nephron, which is the proximal convoluted tubule. This reabsorbs about 85% of the fluid that went out of the blood. So we've got our filtrate coming from the blood here, and the proximal convoluted tubule is this wiggly area as the first part of the nephron. And it's here in which 85% is reabsorbed. So reabsorption does happen at other parts of the nephron, but this is the area which takes up the most. So the reabsorption takes things back from the glomerular filtrate flowing through the nephron, and it goes through the tubule walls and then into the capillaries. So when you look at a nephron and what it's surrounded by, you notice that after the glomerulus has happened, those capillaries go and circulate all around the different parts of the nephron. And these are doing various jobs. Obviously they're oxygenating and delivering things for the cells of the kidney so that they can keep functioning. But the reason they associate so closely with the tubule is so that anything we want to take from the filtrate back into the blood doesn't have that far to go. And so the blood is there waiting to pick up anything that it wants to get back from the filtrate. And then eventually all of that blood will collect and become venous blood, leave via the renal artery and go back to the circulation. So this whole process is what we call not just reabsorption, but selective reabsorption. Selective reabsorption is the reabsorption of only some molecules from the glomerular filtrate back into the blood. So we're selectively choosing certain things to reabsorb and allowing other things just to carry on to the urine. So first of all, we need to reabsorb one of the most important ions or mineral ions in the body, which is known as sodium. And sodium is very important for maintaining membrane electrical balances and also for the functioning of a lot of proteins in the cell. So the tubes in the proximal convoluted tubule are lined with epithelial cells and they use the methods of active transport and secondary active transport to selectively reabsorb molecules. So active transport is when a substance is moved across a membrane against its concentration gradient. So going from an area where there's less of it to where there is more of it using proteins and the help of the energy released from ATP. So this is an important process in reabsorbing certain substances. So if we were to look at a diagram through the wall of the tubule, we've got the lumen here. So this is the area where the filtrate is flowing past. We've got the epithelial cells which line the tube here. And each of these is an epithelial cell. And they're not too far away, we've got the vessels of the blood. So these are the capillaries that are following the cells. And what we tend to say is that these epithelial cells of the PCT have an apical side, which is the side facing the tube, and a basal side, or the side facing the capillary. So the apical side is this side, 
and the basal side is over here. So to help, you know, you might remember this as perhaps a base of the cell which is resting against the blood, and then the apical part is trying to point into the tubule. So we have these pumps called sodium potassium pumps, and these lie on the basal side of the epithelial cells. And what they do is they use ATP, or active transport, to pump sodium ions into the blood, causing a low sodium concentration in the cells. So here we have a sodium potassium pump, and because it's a pump it's using active transport, therefore it's using ATP. And the function of these pumps is to take sodium ions through the cell and into the blood. So what this does is here we get a reduced concentration of sodium ions. So again, just to illustrate the idea of active transport, we use ATP. So the sodium ions here get sent from where there is less of them, so a low concentration to a high concentration, from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, and this itself uses ATP. And so what happens then in the cells is that sodium in the tubule now wants to drive itself into the cell because the concentration is going down and the sodium carries on going to the blood. So the proximal tubule allows reabsorption of sodium from the tubule into the cell where it's being sucked through into the blood. So this is how we reabsorb sodium. We also need to talk about how we reabsorb glucose and amino acids because they're very important food molecules that we need to keep but unfortunately they get filtered through due to their size. So on the apical side of the epithelial cell, we have other types of proteins called co-transporters. So co-transporters transport two types of molecules in together at the same time. So molecule X and molecule Y both travel through the co-transporter to go to the same place, but one can't go through without the other, hence the co-transporter mechanism. So these ones in particular at the kidney only transport sodium in when they can transport glucose or amino acids. So here we have the tubule, and this is the membrane of the epithelial cell. And we're trying to get the glucose and the amino acid into the cell so that it can then get to the blood. We have sodium ions in the tubule, which are being reabsorbed, and they can travel through these co-transporters to get into the cell. And then as we said in the previous slide, they will go through the pump at the basal side and get sent into the blood. And the glucose, or amino acids, depending on which it is, can only go through if the sodium is going through. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone. The glucose goes through, and so does the sodium. And now the glucose can go through to the blood as well. The sodium levels inside the cell are low, because this pump at the basal side is sending sodium out using energy into the blood. So this draws sodium in through the co-transporter with glucose and amino acids up their concentration gradient. So the method that this involves is called secondary active transport. It doesn't directly use ATP like normal active transport, but it's only possible because of the active transport of sodium. So there's an active transport of sodium going on elsewhere at the basal side of the cell, which drives the gradient, driving sodium through a transporter, which can then allow the movement of amino acids or glucose through with it. So it's not directly using ATP, but it relies on the use of ATP elsewhere to drive a gradient which then drives this process. So we call it secondary active transport. So once the sodium and the glucose or amino acids enter the cell, they're free to diffuse down their concentration gradient into the blood. So the sodium is still being pumped into the blood anyway, but the blood is rushing by and the concentration of amino acids and glucose is driving them in via the fusion. Water is another molecule that gets filtered very easily, and obviously it's very important to conserve water as much as we can, otherwise we would become dehydrated very fast. The filtrate contains lots of water from the blood, so we need to reabsorb it to reduce the loss of water. And if we were to look at filtrate, a lot of it is made up of urea, but actually water makes up a large portion as well. So, as we said before, the solutes of sodium, amino acids and glucose are being pumped into the cell via their various mechanisms. And this means that the water potential in the cell is going down, and that in the tubular fluid is becoming higher. This means that the water potential is much higher in the tube, and it's lower in the cell and in the blood. So we've got all of these amino acids, we've got glucose, and we've got sodium in the cell as well. All of them are causing a reduction in water potential, which means that the water that's still in the tube here, the water potential is going up. This means that water is going to follow the gradient from high water potential to low water potential, down its gradient, and this would be osmosis into the cell and then into the blood. So first it enters the cell through the apical side, just through diffusion, or osmosis specifically, 
and then it passes into the blood down its gradient. So this is how we reabsorb water. Most of the water that we reabsorb is carried out here in the proximal convoluted tubule, but some of it is also done later on at the collecting duct. And it's this region which is the collecting duct here. So the role of the epithelium in the proximal convoluted tubule is obviously reabsorption of all of these substances. So how does it do this? It's adapted with specific physical qualities which help it to be good at reabsorption. So first of all, they have these protrusions on their apical side facing the tubular lumen, and these are called microvilli. So this acts to increase their surface area. So here we have the lumen on this side, and obviously this is the apical part of the cell, the basal part of the cell on the other side, and then the blood. So they have these microvilli. So a villus is a projection, but a microvillus is one found on a single cell. So this is one microvillus, and collectively they're called microvilli. So because they've increased their surface area, they've increased the amount of space and membrane for many protein pumps and transporters to be put on their membrane to maximize transport and the reabsorption of all of those substances we talked about before. So if we just had a flat membrane, we'd have a lot less space. But because the membrane is going in and out a lot of times, we have much more space for all of these protein pumps. So we can start reabsorbing all those ions and solutes we need at a faster rate and more efficiently. As well as this, the basal side of the cell also has some folds. It doesn't have microvilli, but it is folded to a certain extent, again maximizing transport from the cell into the blood. So here you've got some vague folding for a bit more of those pumps to be placed down. As well as this, the proximal tubule overall is very tangled and coiled up, hence the word convoluted, and this increases the distance along which the reabsorption can occur. So it stays in the cortex still, but because it takes up a tangled shape, it can use more space around the cortex, rather than just going directly to the loop of Henle. Finally, the cells also are packed with many mitochondria, because ATP can directly, in active transport, and indirectly, in secondary active transport, drive the reabsorption. So when you look into the cells under a micrograph, you would see lots and lots of mitochondria. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.